I tell you what, one of the great things that God is doing in this ministry is bringing us people like Mark, like Greg, like Barry, like all of these people. And we are making an impact together that none of us could ever make by ourselves. And you know, I praise God for what he's done in my life. I am, I am thankful every single day for it. I am not belittling myself, but I am not the full expression of God to the body of Christ. And you know what? We, this is one of the reasons that I think that the body doesn't function better than it does is because we pay, take one person and just like I said to uh, Pastor Greg that him being fired was a token of the leader's insecurity. He was ready to quit and Greg comes in and does such a great job that now all of a sudden he wants to stay because things are working better. And that's insecurity and we need to get beyond that. And I am just so thankful for the way that God has brought all of these different people together. And I tell you, there's something unique happening here. We are making a difference. And I could spend a lot of time, I'm not gonna do it, but it, you know, I've labored in obscurity for four decades and nobody knew who I was or cared who I was. And that's okay because I was serving the Lord. But all of a sudden now God has just granted me favor that uh, there is no explanation for. I'm not doing anything different than I've ever done. It's, there's no reason except God. God has positioned this ministry to have a worldwide impact. And it's really, really awesome what's happening. I tell you what, we've got a little video. Are we prepared to show the Uganda and Kenya video? I'd like to just show you a little bit of what we uh, just got through. We came back in June from uh, England, Uganda, and Kenya. And this is a brief video that will kind of uh, give you an idea of what happened. So let's play that. I just returned from a ministry trip to Uganda and Kenya and it was awesome. It was so good that I don't want to keep it to myself. I want to share with you uh, some of the things that we saw, some of the things that we experienced. God is just doing some wonderful things and we are blessed to be a part of this. Well, so it started with you challenging me three years ago to go out there and find out what the needs were. Um, we were discipling people, but you were touched by the poverty. So you said, how can we help these people? And of course, the key element was water, the lack of it. I, I go across places like this. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we went as far as the road went, and then we drove, dodging trees, came to a river that we couldn't cross, got out and walked for, I don't know, one or two miles and got back into this remote place. Mugongo. And there was a water well yeah. that we had drilled. I mean, they had to get out with machetes and clear brush and stuff to get the drilling machines right. in there. They created a road. And it has changed <coughs> their life. Yeah, it has. But you know, one of the things, Andrew, that, that we found, this just really impacted me. These ladies were talking about walking. It wasn't that, wasn't that particular one, it was the other one. Mm -hmm. But they were talking about walking, having to make eight hour trips to get water. Oh, that's right. Um, yeah. To the mountain where the water that's was right. and then back to their village. And I remember the one elderly lady, little, she wasn't that big around. I mean, just mm -hmm. tiny thing. And she was talking about carrying the water pot on her head and coming back from the mountain and then hitting a tree or spilling it and having to go all the way yeah. back to the mountain to get water. And now the well had just changed all that. That's right. Do you remember Kapetawoy where they, we drilled next to what was a seasonal river? And they said before that well came, there would be water, not very frequently, but if they went down there, they would get snake bites. Yeah. But it was so dry that when the children cried, the bees would come and settle yeah. on their faces for the moisture and their faces would be swollen with bee stings. There's no water in the place. And so, you know, bees pollinate, isn't there? So they're looking for water. So even when children would be crying, bees would be coming. Really? Yeah, yeah the, the place moisture. is a desert. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I didn't realize. Real yeah. desert. Not only are we drilling the well, but we're putting as much emphasis and money into training the whole community. Mm -hmm. So we get, it's an 11 step process process and we have to get buy-in from that community. And Ricky 
is hands on with that. Explain who Ricky is. Ricky is a <coughs> jewel that God <laughs> has given us. He's been out there pretty much two and a half <coughs> years, nearly three years now, on the ground, overseeing the discipling program. But everything that we do, basically, demo is giving people the word and teaching them to fish. And so with the well drilling, he's overseen all of that. And he establishes, I think there's eight people for each well. He makes one person the person right. who's responsible for cleaning it, another one maintenance. That committee is representative of the whole community. They have a chairman, a secretary, and a treasurer. Now here's an interesting thing. As a result of having this committee, which is now a vehicle, and everybody gives a little bit of money towards the well, so there's community ownership, but Ricky's now using that vehicle, if you like, for a savings of vi yeah, village savings and loan scheme. A little green box and it's got something That's stenciled right. on the top about yeah. Andrew Womack It's got Ministries. Andrew Womack Ministries on the top, yeah. And it's got VSLA. <coughs> VSLA. And, and so the uh, Macongo had saved the equivalent of about a hundred dollars in six months time. Mm. Here is the debt, here is the share. One box, one, two, three, four, five. If you can... And the second village that you pronounce? Kopetawoy. There you go. <laughs> Uh, that place had saved the, about $200, yeah. and uh, they had also, uh, what, they had uh, got some land yeah, that they, they had. Bought two, two acres. Two land. acres, yeah. uh -huh. which, which the church right. was using. You know, to. they told us that what they ate was honey. They had bees, and they had honey, and they ate leaves, mm -hmm. and of course, they have a few little goats and cows. Those things are pretty scrawny. You couldn't feed much, but anyway, they don't have hardly anything to eat. They eat twigs That's why and so leaves. Thin. And to raise maize and corn, it's going to change their yeah, whole right. diet. Exactly. One of the things that amazed me when we got to Kenya, we held one day's worth of services, mm -hmm. and uh, we held three services that day. Mm -hmm. But when I got mm -hmm. up and announced things and held up a book, they would all shout and clap. Those people had gotten my material my first time in Kenya, and those people knew my material. Absolutely. It so, was phenomenal. We have a 1,000 students in Kenya and as many as 4,000 nationwide listening to his teachings. We were in several places where we would have anywhere from two to 5,000 people in attendance. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting by Grace LaVega, and you were ministering, and all of a sudden, people just got up. This, there right. was 5,000, 6,000 people. They just got up and started coming to the altar and throwing money down that's at right. your feet. Mm -hmm. And and I just thought, well, that must be common. That that's the way they do it here. And and Pastor Grace leaned over me. He goes, I've never seen. Because then it became hundreds. It was a few at just first. Just about everybody. And then uh, just hundreds and hundreds of people came. And he told me. He said that don't happen. So we need to go on to Kenya. And I want to talk about going to see Mike and Pat Heiser. They're people that I've known for 35 years and they graduated from our Kansas City Karis Bible College and they have gone back to Kenya and they've been in Kenya now I think for 16 years and I think they have, isn't it 16 children that they've yes. adopted? Yes, yeah. off the streets. And they have started, I think they've started 23 Bible schools and they have 26 churches that they've started in these 16 years. And I mean miracles happening, people being raised from the dead, people getting born again, and just awesome things happen. They use our material. All of these kids came off of the street. They're being sold, they're just abandoned. And Mike and Pat, if it hadn't have been for them, every one of these kids would have been dead. But you know, Mike and Pat, uh, they told one story about when they first got there that Pat was just lifted up. She wondered what was happening and the guy was choking her and he, and he choked her until she passed out and hit her head and did some damage to her and stole everything she had. They cut the pants off of Mike and took his wallet. And I was saying things about, man, I just appreciate you so much being here and doing this. And Pat was like, well, there's nothing to it. This is what God called us yeah, to do. I mean, yeah. it's just like, what else yeah. would we be doing? <clears throat> Their house has been attacked and Mike's been stabbed. and yeah. I mean, all kinds of things happen to him. They just act like, it, well, it's just no big deal. They said, it's we're good. doing what God told us to do and whatever happens. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, we were humbled. <laughs> Hello, Andrew. Hello, Daddy. <laughs> so after we left there, we went to Bagoma and flew there and got to meet Dottie Heyman. And I tell you, I love Dottie Hayes. She's amazing. Dottie went there 11 years ago. Right. She is a graduate of our Bible college here in Colorado. She had never left her holler is what nope. she said. So she left there because she heard me on radio. 
She came to Colorado, graduated, and on her second year missions trip, she went to Kenya. And while she was in Kenya, God gave her a vision to stay there. So anyway, after one year back here after graduation, she went to Kenya with $500, That's a right. one-way plane That's ticket. Right. 56 years old. Yep, and when she got there, the people that invited her over, it turned out it wasn't what they said it was. And so she spent three months in a hotel and Sweet. spent 400 of her $500. Right. So she had $100 left. They told her about an opportunity in Bagoma. She went up there with $100 standing by between her and Incredible. death. Incredible. And went there not knowing a single person and she's now been there 11 years, has never come home, yep. feeds uh, 12, 13 kids, multiple widows, widows yep. does yep. all kinds of things. When she first went over there, they were gonna have this child and they were gonna kill it if somebody didn't take it. And so she went and took it the day it was born and they brought this baby to her house and as she put this baby in her arms, she remembered that she had miscarried That's right, a little daughter. girl. Yeah. And the Lord told her 30 something years before yep. that I'll give you another give you girl. And she had forgotten until she got Rachel. That's Rachel. Yeah. And when she, she said she just had to set Rachel down and she got on her knees and just started praising the Lord because 30 something years later, the Lord had given her Rachel. She sent me a letter and just said that her landlord was selling the place that she was living in and she said, just pray. She says, I know God's not gonna put me and these kids out on the street. So I got up in front of our school and I showed her video. Then I read her letter and I just said, if you would like to help, help her. And so our students took up $25,000. She needed $100,000. They took up $25,000. And then one couple came to me afterward and said, we wanna make up the difference, whatever it is. And his wife, Jamie, had bought a pair of boots. There's a little boy there named, was his name Daniel? I think so. I think his name was Daniel. He's about 12 or 13 years old. And he just, the first time he saw Andrew's boots, he just nuts over cowboy boots. He wanted a pair of these boots. I was talking to Dottie about it later. but So Andrew brings these boots when we get there. He didn't even get them out of the box. I was there. And this kid just grabs them out of Andrew's hand. He runs around the side of the house and he's trying those boots on. I want to let those of you know who watch that, of course, we are, you know, building Bible colleges. We're touching people all over the world, but really it just is as simple as what we've described today. These people are out there doing the work of the ministry and they're touching people on a heart level. And I tell you, it's such a privilege to be a part of it. And I want you to know that those of you who give to this ministry, these are the kind of things we do. I forget the exact number, but I know I've counted over 140 different ministries that we support on a monthly basis. Some that go in and rescue children in Ethiopia out of the sex trade. Uh, we've got just things all over the world that we are doing. And when you give to this ministry, you're not only helping us pay our television bills and reach the people in the Bible colleges and things like this, but man, we are touching people, I mean, on the ground floor. I tell you, I could spend all day just talking about how that trip impacted me, but Paul, tell them, we were sitting there at Dottie's table and she fed us sandwiches and stuff, and we just said, tell us about these kids, and every one of them was a miracle. Yeah, you know, the stories are incredible. I wish we had time to tell them all, but I, I tell you what, it, it, it had such an impact. I, I saw it in Andrew's face, too. Me, I was just saying, I couldn't even say anything. I mean, I told Andrew, I said, I mean, I've had a few things humble me in my time, but Dottie Heyman humbles me. This woman is the most incredible. Look, those kids swarming all over her, calling her mama. They, they live and breathe because D Dottie Heyman is their mother. And I told Andrew, I said, man, I, I was choking up. I was tearing up. I couldn't even talk. She'd say something and ask a question. I couldn't even answer. I told Andrew, Andrew later, I said, I'll tell you what, when we get to heaven, you and I are going to be at the back of the line trying to see Dot Dottie at the front of the line <laughs> with Jesus true. giving her reward. I mean, that, this woman is incredible. And look, I, let me say this. I don't want to take up a lot of time, but I, let me, let me uh, just say this. Uh, we, when you see us there at the house, uh, where's Rudy? Rudy's here somewhere, I think. Rudy, Rudy, Van, Rudy Van Tonder. Van Tonder. 
somewhere. There's Rudy. Rudy Van Tonder over here is our director in Africa, he and Cam. And Rudy was there with us, and Mark and I and Rudy at one point just went out in the yard and started walking around. And I, I just asked Dottie, I said, what do you need? Well, I mean, man, I, I would have, I'll listen. I'll sell anything i got to get that woman what she needs. It was incredible. And so I, she said, you know, she took us back into this room. Andrew, remember she took us back to that room with all these buckets? These buckets are stacked to the ceiling, like five-gallon buckets. Maybe they were two and a half gallon. I think that's what they really were. And she said, every morning, the water only comes on at 2 o'clock in the morning. They have to get up, fill up all these bottles with water because it goes off. It'll stay on sometimes an hour, two hours, you know, however long it's going to stay on. They've got to get the, those bottles filled up. And she said, uh, if we just had a steady uh, supply of water. So I started talking to Rudy and Mar. I said, we got to get a well drill right here. And I said, what, what else, Dottie? And she said, well, the electricity is so unreliable, I never know when I'm going to have electricity. So Rudy, he's already working on it. We're going to put solar panels on top of her house and get her, get her supply of electricity right into her home there. So... Uh, Look, I, I know God's, you know, he, he spoke to me through this. I know he's probably speaking to many of you. Help us. You can give toward this. We'll use it to, uh, it, basically what you do is just give to the Uganda Fund. You can call it, that's what we call it. It actually will apply to uh, Dottie where she's there in Kenya. And we're going to help her uh, get her house. And, and here, here's the issue. We, we may have an issue with drilling a well on her property. It's too close to her septic tank and her house. But there's an empty lot. She told me, we walked out in the front yard, and she said, that empty lot right over there, I'm believing God for that empty lot. And I said, don't doubt Dottie. I'm telling you, as soon as she came out, I said, praise God. I said, we just need to help you get the money together when it's time to buy that lot. We could drill a well over there, and she'd have, she'd have all this water. And then with Mike and uh, Pat Heiser, they need a four-wheel drive vehicle. I promised him we, he's going to get a four-wheel drive vehicle. They, they can't even get to their schools and all these other places they're trying to go. And so uh, those, are, those are real needs that, that, that you know, I wanted to share with you, and you're, you're very welcome to help us. But we're going we're gonna, to, listen, how do you not sow into something like that? I mean, I wish we had time to tell you these stories. These people, these people are heroes of the faith. Amen. You know? I mean, I'm, we're lightweight compared to what these folks do. I mean, they're out there on the front line every day and, and just doing it. And so praise God we were able to be there and, and, and see what God's doing. You know, let me also ask all of our directors that are here. We, we had directors meetings last week, and we had over 100 people, and many of them are gone. But I'd like all of our directors of our Caris Bible Colleges around the world to stand up. These guys are heroes. Let's have you all stand up. Praise God. And our AWM offices, too. I see yeah, some of you standing. AWM offices stand up. Man, praise God. These people are making it happen. Isn't that great? Yeah, Hans Bachstein over here, he, he's our director in Uganda, and he was with us through all this, trekked out there with us in the mud and the heat. It was good. He's from Holland, went through the Holland School, and when, when we had a vacancy in Uganda, he just came and has been there. How many years, Hans? Two and a half years. You got to see this little this little lady. Uh, her name's Esther, but she had a silver gray suit on. Okay? She she dressed up for Andrew coming. I can she, tell you. She's <laughs> she awesome. Dressed, I love that woman. She is a doll. Let me tell you about Esther though. Esther, uh, this this is the kind of thing you have to deal with there because of the culture. She's one of four wives, and she got born again, and she's on fire for the Lord. She's walked twenty miles just to disciple people. I mean, they're, the other they're, these people are just skin and bones. I mean, they're just just an amazing what they do out there. But she just loves the Lord, and you know they're caught in this cultural these cultural issues, and you know it doesn't fit all the time what we think things ought to be. But that's where she's as, and she's serving God right there where she is. And so uh, there are many we met many people like this, and uh, and th these people out here, you know, Andrew, we made a comment when we got out there. We flew two hours, we drove two hours, we walked, you know, miles to get back in there, and we get back in there, and there's nothing there, but they all got a cell phone. <laughs> I'm like, do what? Cell because the government has made it dirt cheap for these people to have cell phones. They put up these cell phone towers. There are 18 of these cell phone towers all over Uganda, 
And so these people, they've got this technology and they're learning how to use this technology, but they're poor as they can be. They have no to food. use a solar battery charger because they don't yeah. have electricity, but they have a cell phone. And did you, did you guys see Andrew eating the white ants? Those are termites. So they sun dry those termites and I thought they were pretty good. They're crunchy. I thought they were good. <laughs> so. They, they were impressed that we would eat, they call them white ants, but they're just termites. You know, the first time we met Esther, the uh, first time I met her was probably three or four years ago, and she was walking 11 miles one way to come to our discipleship evangelism course. Can I get one of those discipleship evangelism books? I need to advertise that this morning. But uh, she was walking one way to go to the training. She couldn't read or write. And within six months of being disciples, she believed God, she can read and write now. She's planted six churches. And this woman, matter of fact, that place where we were with the water wells, she planted that church and they are in the process of building the church. And Esther is affecting hundreds and hundreds of people's lives living in a terrible situation. And she's just so happy. They're so excited about what God has done. It's it's awesome. You guys pray. Ricky Burge, y'all saw Ricky? Uh, let me just quickly talk about Ricky for just a minute. Pray for Ricky Burge. Ricky Burge was made to do, be doing what he's doing in Uganda. And Ricky, um, he, he's from Gary, Indiana. He was a gangbanger. Uh, he was, you know, let me tell you where his, his, his life ended up. He was uh, a drug dealer. He was stripped naked, beaten, left for dead in a warehouse. And they stole his gun, yeah. his car, his drugs, everything. And, I mean, everything. His clothes were gone. And, and he told me, he told me at one point, he, he was here third year school. He went to school here. He told me one day, he said, uh, he said, God got my attention with that. I, I, that got my attention. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, he gets, he gets his life right, gets born again, comes to Karis Bible College, does his third year program here. And Greg, you remember when he gave his presentation? We have, we have presentations at the end of the business school and the ministry school. And I'm telling you, he had me charged up. We were, yeah, that's right. He would, he, what we do is the, the, in the ministry school, we do just like we do in the business school, that people have a ministry plan where they're going to go do ministry, where they're going to plant a church. And Ricky gave his presentation. Africa was burning in him. I mean, he had Africa in his heart all over him. And he was so dynamic. He preached. He just got up there and, and people were throwing money on him, just going up to the front and throwing money on him, right? So Rick, but this guy is, he's, he's, he's tough. He comes from a tough neighborhood. And, and so we're over there. I got to tell this one quick story. So we go to this village and, um, and so we walk out to where the well is that we had drilled and it's filthy. I mean, it's, there's, there's animal feces and there's mud and there's all this stuff around. And Ricky just goes off. I mean, he's like... <laughs> And so what, it would take me a while to explain this, but there's a committee of people in each one of these villages that are responsible for that well. And they have to keep that thing clean. And, and we've trained uh, somebody to do the maintenance on that well. And this young man, his name was Daniel, wasn't it, Andrew? The, uh -huh. kid, the kid that was, that was trained. And he's done so well, now he's doing maintenance for other villages, and he's making so much money, he bought a motorcycle. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're creating an economy, getting things going. But listen to what Ricky does. So we go back to the village and everything takes place under the village tree. So we, we had some film of this. I didn't, I didn't see much of it there. But we, we got around this, under this tree, and Ricky starts telling the chief, the LC1, which is really the chief of the village. And he tells him, he, he has him stand up. I mean, this was, this was tough. And he said, you're lazy. You and your people are lazy. He said, this man right here spent a lot of money to drill that well to do that for you. Now, why in the world would he do anything else for you if this is where you're going to treat what he did? I mean, just, and you say, well, that's, that's really hard. Let me tell you something. They, he responded correctly to the correction. The man responded well. His people responded well. That's exactly the guy you need in that because these, these people don't have this kind of discipline. Look, they spent their life trying to survive. Do you think they care about wells and stuff? I mean, they're just trying to get today's food to survive today. And these, but what Ricky's trying to teach them is, look, we're building infrastructure. Your life's going to get easier. You need to concentrate on other things than just what you're going to eat today. And I mean, he has this anointing to see these things. So, you know, we, we talked to him at length about teaching because when we were going to do microenterprise there, uh, and we still are in Uganda. Billy and I are involved with that, raising money for that. Mark Rowe's been involved with us for years with that. I did it in Kenya for the last 16 years. 
And so I told Ricky, I said, you got to teach these people enterprise. You got to teach them to save money. So you all saw the green box. That's the, that's the village savings and loan. This is true. And they keep that in a strong box. It's chained to a tree with a padlock on it. <laughs> and we walked up and Ricky's teaching these people. He's teaching them to do uh, business in the marketplace. And then they collectively save a percentage of that money they make and put it in that strong box. And then that ledger you saw in his hand, they can, they can borrow up to a certain amount and they have to repay it. And that, that all is kept track of. The, they keep records of that. They're teaching these people how to do business in an economy. What, listen, you say, well, that sure is primitive. Well, what would you do with people that can't read or write? How, how are you, they can't come to business school. You got, you got to find verbal ways to train these people and visual things that help them understand what they need to do. So this is a kind of, y'all, how many of you knew Andrew Walt Ministries was doing this kind of thing? How many of you didn't know? Let me ask it that way. How many of you didn't know? Most people don't know. And I mean, this is incredible work that's being done out there. So pray for us. Support us. If you give, you can designate to the Uganda Fund, and we will make sure that that money goes uh, to do this. Later on, let me tell you one of the things you can, you can be thinking about and pray about. Later on, when we get the micro enterprise stuff up and running, and, and what I'm talking about now is these are our graduates from Kampala who can read and write. These are educated people. So they will graduate, and we'll put them in business. We've got a bank there that Billy Epperhart and his organization, is Billy here yet, that started. And so they will borrow funds from that bank. Listen, if you, if you live in Uganda and if you can borrow money for anything, their interest rate's 30 to 35%. How would you like to pay that? So, you know. Plus, the, the Muslims control a lot of yeah. it, and they intentionally will not give to a Christian, Christian, and they will finance people to go buy the Christian churches. They're trying to shut them down. So. They're, they're trying to economically just destroy the Christians. And so we just decided to fight against it. We just created our own bank. How about that? And uh, we started a bank over there with $500,000 in the bank that they are using to loan in this church, one of the churches that you saw that has over 4,000 people in attendance. Man, they've already for a year been making loans. It well, has changed their whole lives, their economy. It, we, we've now, it's about $3 million now. Oh, is it? We've raised well, three million, started with $3 million, $3 million in the bank. Yeah. Listen, their, their failure rate is near zero because of the way Billy has taught them how to do this. And, and Pastor Herbert has some incredible people in his church. They're just, these guys are just incredible. And so one of the things we're going to do is when, when we graduate these people, we will loan them money at very, very reasonable rates, okay, not usury. And they will be able to start businesses. Samuel Hamuza, did you see the guy? You saw Samuel, real tall. He, I was standing in front of him. He just overtowered me. He's like 6'6". Six, six. That's the guy I was talking about that's the, doing the business plan. And so we're going to loan them money at the very reasonable rates so that, uh, so that they can start businesses. Well, one of the things that I did in Kenya was people would give. I had a, my own ministry at the time called, called LifeWalk, and, and people would give to start a business. For instance, we put somebody, I'll give you this one example, and then I'll, I need to hush talking. But we had, I had a guy, we put a guy in business uh, producing eggs, egg business. So he bought hens. He lived out in a village in Western Kenya, and he did every he went through our business school. And every time I'd go, he begged me to come look, come to his village. And they, but this is a big deal to them. When Andrew came to this village, they did they put their very best dress on. Remember, the elder lady had the feather. Mm -hmm. She invited Andrew. She wanted Andrew to see her hut. He gets down, and you know, I mean, I listen. We're fat. <laughs> these these little doorways, you know, and Andrew's trying to squeeze through this doorway. And she's all got her headdress on and all. It's a big deal to him. So finally, I go out to his village, and man, I get welcomed by the elders, and they're all coming out to see me. And I said, oh, I said, well, where are, your, where are your hens? He takes me over into his hut, mud hut, eight feet across, right? And I, and I have to get out and get in his hut, and he's got a roost built inside of his house with his hens in the house with him. That's how proud he was of these hens. So mama and the four kids live on four foot of it, and the hens live on the other four feet. <laughs> It cost us less than $25 to put him in business. All right, now watch this. Today, he supports 14 children in an orphanage, feeds them, clothes them, gives them medical care. He, ha he, he supports a, a group of widows in his own village. All of this through hens laying eggs, chickens. So what, it what would it cost you and I to go into business in America? There, we can do it for little or nothing. 
I mean, the money goes so far. So I would have people give to start a very specific business. We give you the people's names. You can correspond with them. We're going to do that same thing in Uganda when we get the Kampala deal off the ground. But anyway, we could talk about this forever. I better hush so Andrew can. Do I, I need tell to? you, it's just, it's supernatural what God's doing. You do need to tell them that you're going to have an investment meeting. Okay, so uh, I just got... Uh, I just got a couple of uh, letters from Billy this morning. As I said when I announced this the other day, um, we really want to move to, to uh, non-accredited investors. Now, how many of you were here when I talked about accredited investors, non-accredited? Okay. So if you're an accredited investor, you have to have a million dollars in net worth without your home, or you have to have income of 300000 as a couple or 200000 as an individual. Now, not accredited, you don't have to have any of that. And so I've got in my little phone here a opinion letter from an attorney that we're using telling us that we will be able to do non-accredited. So if you're a non-accredited investor, please come to the meeting so we can speak to you about that. But it, it'll be at 1 o'clock this afternoon downstairs in rooms 101 to 104 on that side of the building over there. You go down that hallway, uh, 101 to 104. Uh, come in at 1 o'clock and we'll explain to you how the investment's going to work. We're working on the PPM uh, prospectus now. Uh, we hope to have that done in a couple of weeks. We'll be communicating with everybody that's interested. So whether you're accredited or non-accredited, you're welcome to come to the meeting. What? And Well, uh, we'll make those decisions later on, on non-accredited. The limit on accredited investors is right now is going to be 50000 and that may be, we may lower that to 25 on the non-accredited, but we have, to, we have to get some information together to make that decision. And also, you need to mention an IRA real quick. Oh, yeah. Uh, if you have a self-directed IRA, we are going to make self-directed IRAs eligible in this investment. So what that means is if you have a, a, an IRA and you have money in that IRA and it's a self-directed IRA, you can direct funds out of that to put into this investment from your IRA. Okay. So we will make that part of the package. And so, you know, um, we spent so much time on this already, and I was just thinking that today I was going to receive an offering, but I'd like to go ahead and receive an offering for all of these needs that we were talking about, for Dottie, for Mike, and Pat. And we could spend a lot of time telling you about them, but they're just amazing. You know, one of the stories about Mike that so impressed me, one of these girls, you saw her in the video, but... <laughs> She, she's a hairdresser now. So I think she's 17 years old now and her hair, she had multiple colors in her hair and she was one of those that came out and uh, danced out to meet us. And when she was 11 years old, they got her off the street. She was in the sex trade and they just grabbed her off the street and brought her home and she stayed with them for a while. But uh, for whatever reason, she went back into the sex trade. And Mike and Pat have, their house is small and they have 16 kids plus themselves living in it. And Mike has positioned himself so that he sleeps in between the boys and the girls because they're dragging these kids off the street and they're a little rough around the edges and he has to protect the girls from the guys. So he sleeps in between and he woke up in the middle of the night and realized that this girl, I think her name is Claire, is gone. And so he prayed about it and the Lord showed him where she went. And he went and pulled a man off of her that was having sex with her and drug her back home. He's an ex-cop. <laughs> and he just does what he has to do. There's a number of times he's had to fight people physically and he drug her back home. And anyway, now she just loves the Lord. She's seeking the Lord. It changed her life. And he said that she would have been dead. Every one of those kids would have been dead if it wasn't for them. And Mike and Pat, if you, if you knew them, they are just the plainest people. Their, their uh, thing that they put on their emails that they send out, their newsletters, they say, ordinary people serving an extraordinary God. And Mike and Pat are just as ordinary as you can get. Pat had multiple sclerosis and she's been healed of it. It's not progressed, but she still doesn't talk and walk exactly normal because of the damage that it did to her body. And one time they showed us a place where they were being chased by elephants. They were out watching elephants and there was a whole herd of elephants there. And one of the kids got to throwing sticks at them and got this bull elephant mad. And so this bull elephant charged and... Uh, 
Anyway, Pat couldn't run very fast. She got behind a little tiny tree about that big around, <laughs> and that wasn't going to stop this bull elephant. And so Mike had to turn around, and he stared down. The bull elephant got right in its face and said, in the name of Jesus, commanded it to stop. And that thing stopped right in front of him. <laughs> He's just fearless. These guys are doing awesome, awesome things. They're graduates of our Kansas City Bible College, and they have 23 Bible colleges, 26 churches that they've planted. They don't call them Karis Bible Colleges, but it's our curriculum. But they didn't finish the third year, so they don't qualify for a director, so they just went out and did it on their own, and they used totally all of our curriculum. He showed me my teaching on spirit, soul, and body and everything, and it's our stuff, but we don't credit them or call them, but he started 23 Bible schools and they aren't able to even go uh, visit all of them now because their car doesn't work. And do you remember how much he was saying? Uh, I think it's $20,000 for a used Toyota. They can get a Land Rover or something. It's more expensive, but nobody services it. The car that they have, the reason that they can't use it is because it's not a Toyota and they have a Toyota dealership in Meru where they are, and that's the only dealership they have, so they can't get it fixed. So anyway, we're going to get them a car. And so I'd like to encourage you today to, to help us. This is not what I had planned, but I just think it's the Lord. And if you've been touched and if you'd like to be a part of helping this, Dottie, you know, we, we send Dottie $2,000 a month. And she told us that's her food bill. She sends our, spends our entire $2,000 a month that we send her on food for those 13 kids and all of the widows. It's just amazing. They've had an epidemic of um, AIDS over there because of the immoral behavior and stuff. And so there are a huge amount of widows. And she has dozens of widows that she takes care of. She told us about one widow that she went and saw this lady. And this lady, uh, the, uh, they went through a drought and the grass on the top of her hut died. And because of it, her roof was leaking. And Dottie, for $8, went over and planted grass on this hut. And this woman came out crying and says, why would you do this? Says, nobody has ever done anything for me in my life. Says, nobody has ever cared for me. And Dottie says, no, you're wrong says, Jesus has cared for you the whole time and Jesus sent me from the other side of the world. And so now she just does things like this for widows and she's got dozens of widows that she takes care of. And this woman, it's, I wished you could have been there. It is such an honor to be a part of what she's doing. And she now owns her house. Our school gave her $100,000. She owns that house, debt free. And... Dottie, of course, is a white woman in a black nation, and just a mile or so from her, they uh, completely encircled a church, and we're going to kill anybody who came out, set the thing on fire, and burnt all hundred and something people on the inside. And here's this woman that stands out like a heel thumb in that culture, and she just is there, and they're fearless, and she walks around and does things. I tell you, we just can't say enough good things about it. And so I want to give you an opportunity to invest in that. How do we do this, Paul? Is it, do we need to designate it? Do we need to designate this money or what do we need to do? But anyway, we're, we're going to do this with or without you. So um, it's not like, you know, you have to designate it, but if you would help us, that means we could just use that money someplace else. All right, so we'll make, it at, make out your checks to AWM and just write Uganda or something like that. Well, I tell you what, everything that comes in in this offering, we'll give towards that. So we don't have to do anything for it. So, um, man, I tell you what, we'll give them a good report, tell them about this, and this will really, really bless them. You know, we've got other people here. I know Dave and Carla Watley are over here someplace. You guys stand up. They're Water Springs Ranch. We support them. They have a ministry here in the States and are just doing a wonderful job. And man, I, we are so honored. I don't even know how many people we support, but I know that at one time we had it counted. There's over 140 different ministries that we support. Charlie and Jill put us in touch with the Bradleys who uh, 
uh, rescue these children off the sex trade in, in Ethiopia and different places. And we've invested a lot of money in that. And we support, support Mercy Ministries and I don't even know what else we do. But it's, there's a lot of people. And so, praise God, you're sowing into good soil. You're going to help us reach people all over the world. So, Father, we love you and we thank you so much for the honor, the privilege of all of these people that you are sending all over the world. Thank you, Father, that you care about people in the most remote places on this earth. And Father, thank you for allowing us the opportunity to help reach out and touch these lives, change people. And so, Father, I thank you for it. And we open this up to our friends and partners here. And Father, today in the offering, I pray that you would touch people's hearts and that you would cause them to give abundantly. That, Father, we could drill many more water wells, help people get on their feet established, put out the gospel. Father, we just thank you. And we sow into this and believe that it's going to touch people's lives and that it's going to come back to us a hundredfold, that we will increase so that we will have even more to give and help other people. And we thank you for that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So you can receive the offering. You know, while they're doing that, I've had a bunch of people come up to me and talk about the teaching that I've been doing on discipleship and saying, man, what do we, how do we disciple people? What do we do? This is something that I put together. I'm not even sure how many years ago. Don Crow and I did this. Actually, I forget the exact timing, but it's over 20 years, maybe 25 years ago. The Lord spoke to me that we had to start discipling people. You know, I think that this was before we had the school, if I'm not mistaken. So the school's been in operation for 23 years, and so it was before that. So it's at least 25 years ago, and I just said, I've got to start discipling people. What do I do? And Don Crow was out knocking on doors, leading two and three people a day to the Lord, and great things were happening. But I got to talking to him. I said, Don, it's wonderful what you're doing, but we've got to disciple people. And so anyway, we talked about it. And what this is, we, we came up with 48 lessons. And, and it's kind of like a circle. The first 16 lessons, the first level of this is just really simple, foundational, basic truths. Like the very first lesson is there, in there is my teaching on, disciple, on um, eternal life and how that getting saved, getting your sins forgiven is not the goal of salvation. The goal of salvation is knowing the Lord. It's eternal life. John 3, 16, John 17, 3. And, and so that's the very first thing we teach. We talk about water baptism. We talk about just foundational things, identity, who you are in Christ. Then the second uh, level, the second 16 teachings are all about how you relate to other people. It's marriage. It's church. It's uh, how do you, uh, you know, deal with things, finances, and all of these kind of things. And then the third level, the third 16, is all about how do you take these truths and disciple other people. So it's actually like a circle. You start down here without knowing very much. And by the time you reach the end of this thing, you are qualified to take a person through this. And so in the front of it is a CD-ROM. And this has everything that's in this book that you can print it out. And the purpose of this is so that you can become a discipler and you can teach other people. And uh, it's just real simple. I make these radical statements like in uh, the first teaching on the eternal life that the real purpose of salvation isn't to get your sins forgiven. And man, it just shocks people when you hear something like that. What do you mean? Because that's what the church has preached. No, the real purpose is so that you can have, Jesus came and gave his life for us so that we wouldn't perish, but have everlasting life. The goal is everlasting life. And that's not talking about heaven. It includes that. But it says right there in that same chapter, chapter 3, verse 38 or something says, he that believes will has everlasting life. He that believes not will not even see life. Everlasting life doesn't start when you get to heaven. It's a present tense relationship with the Lord. John 17, 3, Jesus said, this is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And so we teach that it's not about getting your sins forgiven. It's about knowing God in an intimate way. And we make these radical statements and then you put down questions. And it's like, are you saying that forgiveness of sin is not the goal of salvation? 
and you just have people discuss it. There's no right and wrong answers. And then you turn over and read the scriptural answer. I call it discipleship for dummies. It's impossible for you to mess this up. You just take these radical statements, you read the questions, you discuss it, you read the answers, and you disciple people through this. It's awesome. We've got over a million people a week going through this all over the world. There are millions of people that are taking this. And so anyway, for those of you who are asking about teaching or how do you disciple somebody, this is a great thing to use right here. And I tell you, it is inspired of God. It's gone through a number of revisions, but we've never changed the order, the context or anything like that because it has, we have seen this change people's lives by the hundreds of thousands all around the world. And it's something that uh, we are just beginning to make a big push in this in our schools because some of our schools don't even teach this. And yet this is one of the premier discipleship tools that we have. So uh, anyway, we're beginning to make this a standard thing. And it's a great way to go in and do anything is just start with this. Man, I'll let you give that to somebody if you're going to disciple other people. This can't be just for yourself. If you're going to use this, then I'll let Matt give that to somebody. Well, I have some awesome things to teach today, but maybe next time. <laughs> Seems like my time is one that always gets taken up with something. But you know what? I got more time than everybody else, so I guess that's okay. You know, we're just here to glorify the Lord. That's all we're after. And if, uh, if the Lord leads us in a different direction, that's just awesome. Praise God. But I tell you, I appreciate all of our partners. I, I don't say this often enough, but you know, it is phenomenal, phenomenal what we're doing. Amen. We give away all of our material. You know, we have a suggested donation and things like that. But we say, you know, if you uh, send anything in, and people will send, we've had people send in buttons. We've had people send in a penny and we send them their stuff. Over 53% of the people that contact us don't give a thing. And they ask for our materials free. We have given away literally hundreds of millions of books, CDs, DVDs. And uh, we say that, you know, here's a suggested donation but unless it's a package where it's like a hundred dollar value or something like that, we'll say it's for a gift of any amount. And it is phenomenal how God meets our needs. And it's because of you. And I don't know if you notice this, we hope that you do, but when we say, you know, this is for a gift of any amount, or if you can't give, our, we'll give this to you. Our partners have enabled us to do that. We say that because really you are the ones that make this ministry work. We're different than most ministries. We don't compensate for people that don't have the money. And plus, when we started our website, did you know I remember having a discussion and they sat down and said, now you aren't going to make everything on the website free, are you? And we discussed it for a while and I said, look, it's cheaper for me to put this out through the website than it is to produce the, the actual CDs or DVDs and send them out. I said, why wouldn't I do it this way? I said, it saved me money. And uh, so anyway, we have made our internet all free and there's very few things on there that you have to get. And because of it, we have over a million people a month that are on our website getting materials free. I never will forget the night that Ashley's daughter, Hannah, got healed. How many of you have seen Hannah's testimony? Man, not that many. You guys need to go see this testimony. That's about half or less of this group. But man, she was on her deathbed. The doctors had sent her home to die. Three and a half years old, wearing nine month old clothes, had never eaten solid food, had to have it pulverized. And she had finally gotten to where she had a tube into her stomach and was being fed a special solution and her body had even rejected that. So the doctors sent her home to die. And anyway, Ashley and Carly uh, were given a tape that had sat in a drawer for 15 years, a free tape that our partners enabled me to send to England probably 20 something years ago. And uh, Ashley's father-in-law could not tolerate my voice. And so he just threw that tape in a drawer and they had a rental car that didn't have a CD. It only had cassettes. And so they said, do you have a cassette tape? And they rummaged through and found this old cassette tape they listened to it. It lit a fire on the inside of them and they went to our website and in what, two weeks or short period of time, 
listened to everything that I had and because of it, their daughter was miraculously healed. And I never will forget that night during praise and worship, Ashley was running around with Hannah on his shoulders and they were dancing, praising God for the healing. And so I asked him just to come up and tell people what had happened. And I never will forget, Ashley said, thank you for all of you that are partners. Says if you weren't partners and if you hadn't enabled Andrew to give these tapes away, my daughter would be dead. Man, that's awesome. Praise God. So I want to thank all of you who are partners. You're enabling us to do things that, man, it just couldn't be done. All of the things you see here, and man, we just are getting started. It's because of our partners. I don't know if you've noticed, but I probably said this to dozens of people. I said, how do you like the place that you built? <laughs> this is your place. This is, the, this is the place that our partners have built. And you guys are changing people's lives all over the world. You know, huh? We have a partner table downstairs, my better half is telling me. And if you would like to put, if you aren't a partner, you, why not? Man, why wouldn't you want to be a part of this? All right, if, if they said we have partner cards here. If any of you are interested, this is not a commitment, but if you just say, well, I'd like to think about this, uh, we've got partner cards. If you'll hold your hand up, we've got ushers that'll pass out a partner card. And we would love to have you sign up and be a part of what we're doing. Just keep your hand up and they'll, they'll get you a card. You know, let me share with you that back in 2002, when the Lord spoke to me about how I was thinking small and I needed to start thinking bigger, uh, I, me and, and some of my staff, we went to a Dave and Joyce Meyer meeting in Florida, if I'm not mistaken is where it was, and we wanted to see how they did their conferences and learn some things so that we didn't have to make the same mistakes. And anyway, Dave and Joyce Meyer, when they first got started, they were holding a meeting here in Green Mountain Falls and they had heard me on the radio and this is before she had ever been on the radio or television and they asked us if we would go out to eat with them and they asked me, how do you get started in ministry? And so I helped give them some pointers. <laughs> and then they passed me up like I was going in reverse. <laughs> but anyway... So here we were wanting to get started in television. So I said, I need a pointer from you. So we went out to eat with Dave and Joyce Meyer and we were uh, there eating with them. And Dave says, you're the guy that gives all of your tapes away, aren't you? <laughs> and it wasn't complimentary the way that he said it. And so I said, well, yeah, I am. And uh, anyway, David Hardesty that was with me, he says, let me tell you how that works. And he got to talking about how that we average, and I forget now what the figures were, but we average somewhere around $85 per gift that people gift us, and we give all of our materials away. We started giving them these testimonies and talking about how much money was coming in, and I mean, Dave's jaw nearly hit the table, and he never said another word. And did you know ever since then, they give a lot of stuff away? <laughs> And there's a lot of people now giving a lot of stuff away. And so it works. It works even for a preacher. It's not only something you can preach. It'll work for a preacher. Come up here, Paul. I tell you what, Paul, it's not hard to get him wound up. This guy just stays full. He's always, he's always on fire. I thought you might like to know if you take all the product that goes out of the ministry as a whole, aggregately, 50, about 55% of it is given away. So 45% of it we get money uh, back on, but 55% but or so of it goes out totally free. That's all I was going to tell them. That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> Have you guys got, you know, we got eight minutes. Paul, stand up here. <laughs> since, we're, since we're talking about all of this, this has turned into a partner deal, I guess. Uh, yeah. Have you got a question for us? This guy knows all of the scoop on everything. This is a rare opportunity for you. You know, you might like to know while you're thinking about that, <clears throat> three years ago, we had about 17,800 partners. And um, we put a lot of things in place, marketing, all kinds of things. We did some special things with Andrew on television. And today we, have, we are coming up on 40,000 partners. Is that good? <clears throat> 
which... Uh, so it took me 46 years to come up with 17,000 partners, and in the last three years, we've come up with, what would that be, 23,000? 23,000 partners. I told him, I, when we did this, I said, Andrew, you get to set the goal. How many new partners do you want in the next year? Well, he comes back and says he wants 10,000. I'm like, took you 38 years or whatever it was at that time, 40 years, whatever it was, to get 17,000, but he wants 10 in a year. No problem. I told him, I said, if, if you tell me you heard that from God, we'll do it. And he said, I heard it from God. <laughs> so guess what? We did it. We got 10,000. And now, though, listen. Our, Before we reached that goal, I said, I want 100,000. You year. did. I wasn't going to tell you that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, um, we're headed to 100,000. But you know what happened was we, we reached that goal. And a lot of ministries, and I mean, I've studied this stuff some, and, and a lot of what people would, this kind of thing, it's a one-off event. They'll meet the goal, and then everybody goes off and does something else, and it kind of levels off. Well, the three years before April, about uh, summer of 2014, we just leveled off. As a matter of fact, we went from 19,000 down to below 18,000. So we were kind of trending this way. Well, today we're doing this, and it's never, it's never let up. We don't have any of this. We've had a constant growth in partnership from summer of 14 to today. Today our acquisition rate is about 12,000 a year, not 10,000 a year. So that's the people that, God, that, that God's impacting their lives, coming into the ministry. And, of course, that does translate into revenue, which we need. If, if any of you noticed the building next door? We really need to get that thing finished, praise God. And that's what every dime we get our hands on goes into that building so that we can get that thing finished. We had a special promotion last June the 13th where the Lord spoke to me about what's in your hand. And so I went on television and did that. And we just had a huge response. And so uh, I asked them to start tracking what had happened since then. So we just finished a year of that. And in one year's time, from June the 13th, uh, 2016 to 2017, we had 12,687 new partners that produced, I think it was just under $600,000 in revenue per month. Per month. And let, let me give you another statistic that's interesting about partnership. So one of the big issues with partnership is fulfillment rate. You can have, you can have 40,000 people uh, pledge to be your partners, the, but the issue becomes how many of them meet their pledge. When I came, we were at about 69, 70%. And, and a lot of ministries are less than that. Much less. Much less. We were doing good that. at 70 We were actually doing great at 70. Most of them around 55 to 58% of people actually fulfill their pledges. Well, we have been at 86% for now almost 18 months. And, you know, it, it sort of begs the question, well, what, what happened? Why is that? Because I, here's what I told the team when we started this process. If we will love serve and bless our partners, they'll bless us. That's economy. That's the way God's kingdom works. You bless somebody, you get blessed. And we instituted two plus two plus two onboarding plan, several strategies where we take care of partners. Let me tell you, I mean, I'm going to get myself in trouble saying this, but we minister to our partners. I have business people, millionaires who will come and they will, they'll give Andrew's ministry five, ten thousand $10,000 to spend the day with me or Billy. I mean, we, 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 and not just to get money, we will do this for partners. We've helped partners, uh, some that are, some of them are sitting in this room, but just here recently, we've had partners come up and we've helped them expand their businesses. We've done all day sessions with them where we help them put, put together business models. So we do these kind of things, not because we're trying to get people to give us money. Our goal is to bless them. And we know God will take care of us. And so you that had just whole, filled up your calendar. I did. It was getting kind of low anyway. I mean, I, we, don't we, have enough to we've do. been running for six months, night and day anyway. But that whole, that whole uh, aggregate of things I talked about are what build partnerships and ministry like we're doing. I mean, I look at this, you, we're in covenant together. I've got 15 hours of teaching on covenant if you wonder what I just meant by that. But there's a lot about being in covenant together and it's not just some loose relationship. I believe God speaks to people's hearts to be partners of this ministry because he wants to bless them. Listen, you, you, you become a partner of this ministry, and I'm telling you, this man's anointing gets on you. It affects your life. 
It will change your circumstances. It will give you everything that you need to fulfill the calling of God on your life. And I think that's huge. That's worth any amount of money that anybody could give. And so partnership to me is the most, it's is just something we concentrate on. We pray over, we want to take care of our partners. You can contact me anytime you want to. If you're a partner of this ministry, I'll tell you anything. You can see anything you want to see. You can walk into the accounting department. I'll show you the books. This is the most transparent man I've ever known. A little too transparent sometimes. He, but we're transparent. We're not hiding anything. We're good stewards. You're welcome to come see how, whether you think we're good stewards or not. Okay? But it's hard work to do this. And I want you to know as a part, I, I am thankful for you. I know what makes this ministry run. And I told Andrew three years ago, I said, look, what I want to do, what I want to lead this ministry to is sustain revenue growth till Jesus comes. And that's exactly what we've experienced. Sustain revenue growth every month that goes by. We can expect it revenue to increase fifty to $100,000 a month just through what's being done in the ministry to bless our partners. Okay, I'll shut up. So let me mention uh, Michael and Donna Leshner. Are you in here? Way back there, Michael and Donna, and then Greg and Tracy Asia. Are you in here? Here's Greg Asia right there. I think Tracy's probably working. She's Daniel's assistant. But these, these men right there and Donna, they travel, and they just go around and visit our partners and love on them and give them things, and that's uh, their whole job. We don't ask for a thing. We want you to know that we love you. And so these people go around and man, they are a blessing. They give me reports, tell me about things. If you have a need, you tell them, they'll let me know about it. And then we have a bunch of people here on staff and I, I'm not sure I could even name all of those, but we have an entire partnership department that we make over 6,000 outbound calls per month where we just call our partners and pray with you. If any of you ever got a call or a visit from us, raise your hand. Man, look at this. That's about maybe 25%, a fourth of the people in here. So anyway, we do appreciate you, and I don't get an opportunity to say that often enough, but our ministry is more dependent upon partners than most because we don't compensate by selling our materials. Again, I say I put a price and say here's what it's worth, and we suggest it, but like Paul said, the majority don't give anything. So our partners are what makes this work, and you have a big stake in everything that's happening. And just like uh, Patrick and Teresa that gave their testimony, man, I've, I just sh shared with them briefly, but they are in a situation where I think they said a town of maybe 60,000 people or something, and there's possibly 10 believers. And they have no fellowship, and they're over there trying to learn a totally different language. I mean, it's unbearably hard. And they talk about how important it is to come back and just be in this atmosphere and stuff. And, and you are enabling us to help people like this. And we're sending people all over the world. Amen. I was just, we just had, I've got a, no, I guess I need to quit. Last story. Last story. I just had a guy that, uh, he runs, um, I forgot the name of it, but anyway, it's a Pakistan television station one of the only Christian television stations. And I don't even know why it happened, but they gave him a license. He opened up and we went on his station maybe two years ago or something and they bombed it and burned it out. And so we sent them $40,000 to be able to get them back on air and get to a secure location. And he was just here either last week or at the business summit two or three weeks ago. And anyway, I visited with this guy and he is just, they get... 6,000 calls per day, people asking for salvation. We just had 35,000 calls last month, and that was a high month for us. He gets 6,000 calls a day, and he has six people answering the phones. But they do it 24 hours a day. And I, anyway, I don't even know how he does it. But they are making a huge impact. And he said, our program, there's only two non Pakistani programs on it, and mine is one of them, and we have it dubbed into the uh, whatever language it is. And he says that it is one that gets the biggest response. He just was thanking me for it. And in Dubai, they can't do a lot of things in Pakistan because, man, uh, they'd be killed for it. But in Dubai, the people are totally open to it. And he says he's starting a, a ministry there. He wants me to come hold meetings. We've got an imam in Dubai 
that teaches my spirit, soul, and body discipleship thing every week in the mosque. I don't even know how they do that. But I, I did have one guy who was a pastor in Dubai tell me that it's because they have to be a Muslim by, to be a citizen. So they are born Muslim, but they aren't practicing Muslims. He told me about they had a praise service where they had over 50,000 Muslims coming, this worshiping Jesus. <laughs> they're having great things. So they're, they're Muslim in name only, but there is total religious freedom. And matter of fact, in Dubai, the government will even pay for a church for the Christians and supply them with a place to meet and everything. They don't, it is a Muslim nation, but there's total freedom there. So anyway, he's wanting me to establish an office in a Bible college in Dubai. And he says that TV station will funnel thousands of people into it. And we've got some people here. I talked to them this week who they're praying about going to Craig Dubai. And Kim Young Where are you? Craig. Craig and Kim, young husband. Are you here? They must not be here this morning. They were here last night. And anyway, they're praying about going over there. We're going to have Bible school there. And I tell you, it's just awesome what God is doing. And those of you who are partners in this ministry, you know, in the secular world, they say you need to diversify. Don't put all of your eggs in one basket in case there's a crash. Well, you are diversified all over the world through this ministry. The sun never sets on Karis Bible College. Amen. So you sow into this ministry, you're going to reap great results.